diabetes. Dr. Kalyani is going to talk about diabetes. Um, she's an associate professor of medicine here at Johns Hopkins, has an inpatient and outpatient um, a practice, and, and among her uh, her current titles includes that she is the editor-in-chief of the Johns Hopkins uh, Patient Guide to Diabetes website, and also she currently serves as president of the Maryland Board of Directors of the American uh, Diabetes Association. So welcome, Dr. Collier. Uh, well, it's truly a pleasure to be able to speak to you today, and uh, thanks to the previous speakers who have already shared a little bit about what I'll be talking about. Um, so I have no disclosures, and I'm going to start by talking just a little bit about the background of diabetes. So we all know that diabetes is growing. It's a chronic disease, and as people age longer, more people are living with diabetes. There's also multiple changes in lifestyle, increasing obesity, sedentary activity, as Dr. Shack talked about, that are leading to an increased prevalence of diabetes, uh, both in the United States and the world. So the most recent estimates in the United States is that more than 30 million adults have diabetes. Another 84 million have prediabetes. And don't let the pre fool you. Prediabetes is considered a distinct disease state uh, associated with both micro and macrovascular complications. And so this is a grave concern that we have a large number of people, more than 100 million people in our country, who have prediabetes or diabetes. And prediabetes as a disease state leads to type 2 diabetes within five years if appropriate interventions aren't implemented. And lifestyle changes, including diet and exercise, is what I'm going to talk about today. Just to give you a sense of the global context, more than 400 million people have diabetes in the world. And so what we're talking about today is not really just here within the United States, but really uh, affects people all around the world. And this is a graph uh, from the most recent Center for Disease Control report issued in 2017 that demonstrates that really diabetes affects people of all ethnicities. Uh, this is American Indian, Alaskan Native, Asians, Blacks, Hispanics, Whites, both men and women. And so we're really talking about a disease that affects people of diverse backgrounds. So exercise is and continues to be a cornerstone of diabetes management. Even a single bout of exercise uh, it has been found to lower blood glucose levels in people with type 2 diabetes. We know that regular exercise improves glycemic control in type 2 diabetes, but of concern is that people with type 2 diabetes tend to be more sedentary than the general population. So we do have a somewhat of a hurdle to get our people with type 2 diabetes, our patients with type 2 diabetes, to exercise. And we know that this can lead to worse cardiovascular outcomes uh, if, uh, if we don't have uh, regular physical activity. Current guidelines from multiple professional societies recommend regular exercise for persons with diabetes. I'm going to talk about those we have from the American Diabetes Association briefly. However, the majority of people with type 2 diabetes do not meet these guidelines. So again, we still have a ways to go. So just in full disclosure, the Standards of Medical Care and Diabetes is our annual physician statement that's published in January of each year. It's a 150-page document that is the sole source of clinical practice guidelines for the American Diabetes Association um, beginning in 2018. And I just finished my term as chair of this committee. And so um, it is not the only guidelines out there, uh, but it is arguably one of the uh, most cited for diabetes and exercise. And so I'll talk a little bit about them today. Um, in talking about clinical guidelines, uh, we're asked to give you the grading of the recommendations as well. And this is the grading we use in the ADA. Level of evidence A is a randomized control trial. Uh, level B is well-conducted cohort study. C, randomized control trial or observational study with some methodological limitations. And E is expert consensus. So these are our current guidelines for physical activity in people with type 2 diabetes. Excitingly, this year in 2018, we have a new section for children with diabetes. And so that's the first recommendation that you'll see there uh, that targets children with diabetes. The second recommendation, which I'll read, most adults with type 1, level C, and type 2, level B, diabetes should engage in 150 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic activity per week. And we give some guidelines guidelines here on how that should be administered. This comes from our diabetes and exercise physician statement um, that was jointly endorsed by the American College uh, of Sports Medicine as well. And um, these recommendations were developed in conjunction with that society. 
Adults with type 1 and type 2 diabetes should engage in two to three sessions per week of resistance exercise. So this is really important because if you ask patients with diabetes, what kind of exercise do you do, many of them will focus on their aerobic and they may not recognize the importance of resistance exercise as many of us in this room would. All adults, and particularly those with type 2 diabetes, should decrease the amount of time spent in daily sedentary behavior. So again, you already heard about the importance of that earlier, uh, and this was a new recommendation we added last year. And we talk about how it's important to interrupt sedentary behavior every 30 minutes. And then lastly, flexibility training and balance training are recommended, particularly for our older adults. So the point of these recommendations is really to encapsulate that it's not just aerobic activity, but resistance, decreasing sedentary activity, and also flexibility training and balance as a holistic exercise regimen that we really recommend for our patients with diabetes. So we have multiple well-conducted trials, not just here in the United States, but in other countries as well, that have shown the benefits of reducing uh, the progression from prediabetes to diabetes using intensive lifestyle modifications. In most of these trials, there's a low-fat, hypocaloric diet that was prescribed in addition to a moderate-intensity exercise regimen of 150 minutes per week. So that's where our recommendations come from, with a goal usually about a 7% weight loss, but in reality, the attained weight loss was 5%. So that's why we say 5 to 7% weight loss. And you can see here that we've had multiple trials in um, China, the Deking Prevention Study, Finland, the Finnish Prevention Study, and the United States, the Diabetes Prevention Program, which I'll talk about. So the Diabetes Prevention Program was part of one of the largest randomized trials that evaluated the effects of an intensive lifestyle intervention, including diet and physical activity in people with prediabetes, so impaired glucose tolerance. And what this study found was that a goal weight loss of greater than 7%, again, the attained weight loss was actually 5%, and a goal of 150 minutes per week of physical activity reduced the incidence of diabetes by 58% when compared to placebo. So this was actually a, a landmark study uh, when it came out um, in, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, because metformin was the third arm and wasn't as effective as physical activity. It only reduced the diabetes incident by 30%, only meaning that in comparison to physical activity, but still very effective. And perhaps most surprisingly, physical activity was most effective in older adults. So while we think about older adults as potentially having mobility or physical activity limitations, this was actually most effective in that population. And though weight loss was a stronger predictor of decreased diabetes incidence in this study, achieving the recommended level of exercise uh, activity predicted greater weight loss and alone decreased diabetes risk by 44%. So this study really highlights the importance of exercise in preventing the progression from prediabetes to diabetes and is really one of the main reasons that exercise is the first therapeutic recommendation we give to people with prediabetes. We also have a companion study uh, called the Look Ahead Study that was conducted in people who already have diabetes. The Action for Health and Diabetes study evaluated whether a lifestyle intervention similar to DPP with, but with 150 75 minutes per week of activity could reduce major cardiovascular events in those with diabetes. And while the study didn't find uh, evidence of the uh, reduction in the heart outcome, there were multiple metabolic benefits that were found and in increased health-related quality of life. So uh, in summation, both of these studies show the wide-ranging benefits of exercise in those with prediabetes and diabetes, both in terms of reducing the progression to diabetes and also in terms of other metabolic benefits as well. And is the reason that we continue to recommend exercise as a cornerstone for prediabetes and diabetes. So we know that exercise has an important effect on lowering hemoglobin A1C. A1C is an average indirect uh, glucose measure uh, of glucose levels over the past three months. Um, and it's been shown to lower A1C by an average of approximately 0.6%, uh, even without a significant change in, in body mass index and sometimes even weight. Um, there's also other health benefits as well, greater muscle strength, improved insulin sensitivity, uh, regular exercise and type 1 diabetes, and higher levels of exercise are associated with greater improvements in physical fitness as well. There have been studies in Look Ahead that have shown that people who are more physically active with diabetes at baseline actually have reduced incidence of mobility limitations over the long term as well. So we, we have multiple reasons to recommend exercise in our, in our population of people with diabetes. 
There's special considerations as well. You also heard from Dr. Ratchford about peripheral arterial disease, which is much more common, up to two, threefold uh, higher, depending on the statistics you look at, in people with type 2 diabetes. And exercise is important for both diabetes and peripheral arterial disease, uh, however, is much underused. And so there's multiple reasons that people with diabetes complications really need uh, exercise. However, there are some complications that might make it more difficult for people with um, type 2 diabetes to exercise exercise, uncontrolled hypertension, untreated proliferative retinopathy. You heard from Dr. Remelo about other eye conditions as well that people with diabetes can have, uh, autonomic neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, and foot disease. If you have a really painful foot, it can be really hard to exercise. And unfortunately, this is a complication of untreated type 2 diabetes uh, that can impair um, the ability to engage in physical activity. We also have other considerations. Uh, one of the central treatments of, uh, of diabetes is to lower blood glucose. But when you exercise, uh, we know that skeletal muscle, particularly in the postprandial state, uh, is the primary source of glucose uptake. And so when you're exercising, your sugars can drop low. And this can last for several hours, even after people have finished exercise, due to increased insulin sensitivity. Um, it's less common in patients who are treated with medications that don't have hypoglycemia as a main side effect. So insulin and sulfonylureas are, are the two classes of medications we usually uh, are more concerned about in terms of reducing the dose when people are engaging in exercise. But for some patients, and I have some patients for whom this is the case, intensive vigorous exercise may actually raise blood glucose levels instead of lowering them, um, especially if their levels were higher to begin with. So I want to also um, uh, leave you with the thought that um, many people can exercise and do so at a professional level. So Jay Cutler is probably the most visible um, athlete with type 1 diabetes, uh, who's a quarterback uh, uh, for the Dolphins. And, um, as for those of you who are Orioles fans and may have been here for a while, Jason Johnson, who was a pitcher for the Orioles from 1999 to 2003, also pitched with type 1 diabetes. At that time, wearable technology in our world, that's insulin pumps, was not allowed. And so he had to take his pump off, a pump being a portable device that delivers insulin continuously for people with type 1 diabetes during his games. And he had a hypoglycemic seizure during one of his games, which prompted uh, the professional uh, athletic organizations to allow people with type 1 diabetes to wear insulin pumps. So we've certainly come a long way in terms of managing and treating people with diabetes who engage in physical activity at all levels, whether it's unusual uh, physical activities or also at the professional level. So these are special considerations, but they do not preclude anyone from being involved in physical exercise. So as I mentioned, diabetes is associated with low cardiorespiratory fitness. And you can see here that in the right-hand column that people with type 2 diabetes have lower VO2 max uh, than those who are lean and obese without diabetes, even at a similar effort, and suggesting that, um, and, and I don't give you uh, statistics here on the duration of diabetes, but giving you the sense that people with diabetes do have lower cardiorespiratory fitness. And we know that aerobic exercise capacity is impaired in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, there could be multiple factors, reduced cardiac output, reduced skeletal muscle blood flow, and there also could be a heterogeneous distribution of blood flow within the microcirculation as well. All of these could impact aerobic capacity and um, is still an ongoing area of research. Type 2 diabetes also impairs exercise performance. So um, hyperglycemia itself may impair exercise performance, and I'll show you a study we did at the end of my presentation looking at that. Endothelial dysfunction, myocardial dysfunction, even skeletal muscle dysfunction due to insufficient oxygen supply. So whether type 2 diabetes can exercise at the same capacity, I've just shared with you stories about professional athletes, so we know they can, but it might be more difficult. However, there's multiple benefits of exercise, particularly in people with type 2 diabetes, for, for, for the reason um, it's so important is that it can um, help uh, both with improving glycemic control by, by enhancing the GLUT4 protein activation. It can also um, help with shear stress. And in an environment of chronic hyperglycemia, um, it can also uh, help with um, uh, increased reactive, uh, decreasing reactive oxygen species and, and vascular inflammation. So there's multiple benefits of exercise as well. We also know that there's multiple metabolic benefits too on hypertension and insulin resistance and also hyperlipidemia as well. 
There's multiple potential mechanisms of improvement, which I've already talked about. And we think that some of this is uh, in a dose response relationship. So those who exercise more can actually reap more of the benefits. So um, I want to talk about the sugar hypertension and physical exercise study that was conducted here uh, at Johns Hopkins. The PI is our very own Carrie Stewart. And this was an important study of exercise in people with type 2 diabetes. It was a six-month randomized controlled trial in persons with type 2 diabetes to determine the effect of a supervised exercise intervention on blood pressure, which was a primary outcome, and multiple other uh, cardiometabolic outcomes as secondary outcomes. The study recruited participants aged 40 to 65 with untreated suboptimal blood pressure or treated hypertension, uh, and they were recruited from the Baltimore area between the years of 2004 to 2010. 140 participants were randomized, but 114 completed. And the exercise intervention is listed here. Three sessions per week of resistance and aerobic components over 26 weeks. Uh, I've listed the aerobic and the resistance exercise components there. The control group was given just usual physical activity uh, advice, but no supervised exercise intervention. And all participants were given the AHA dietary guidelines. So in a study led by uh, Dr. Dobroshelsky, who will be speaking later today, um, this looked at uh, the primary results from this study. And what you can see here is the baseline characteristics of those participants who are randomized to each of the arms, the exercise versus control group. And what was found was actually um, uh, surprising to the hypothesis in that there was not a significant change in blood pressure before and after the trial. However, um, the pulse wave velocity uh, and assessment of arterial stiffness also didn't change very much, and there's um, some suggestion that maybe that could be a potential mechanism for this case. However, there are multiple benefits seen. The A1C you can see here was um, lowered in those who are in the exercise group, as we talked about. You can see that the peak oxygen uptake was also higher in those with diabetes, as was the muscle strength. And I don't show the rows here, but even though there wasn't a sizable change in, in body weight, body composition, less fat, increased muscle, actually changed significantly. So we think there's multiple benefits, as I mentioned, to exercise in diabetes. In a study that we did um, in this uh, cohort, the SHAPE2 cohort, we looked at the question of whether people with diabetes can recoup some of the muscle they lose as a result of their chronic disease state. So I, I didn't talk about our other research in this area, but we found that people with type 2 diabetes actually lose muscle a lot faster than people without type 2 diabetes. And what we wanted to see is whether it's due to the high blood glucose levels, is it toxic to the muscle, and is this reversible? And what we found, actually, is that those with the highest blood sugar levels, uh, just on the right-hand side, actually gained the most lean mass after the exercise intervention, and they lost the, the most fat mass, suggesting that having higher blood sugars at baseline actually may be more beneficial in terms of the body composition benefits, but at the very least didn't interfere with the benefits that we would expect. Lastly, I want to touch briefly about upon sex differences in exercise and diabetes. Um, it's not just limited to diabetes, but I'm not sure how much has been spoken about that today. But there is a growing research suggesting that there are differences in the way that men and women exercise, particularly in diabetes. We know that women with diabetes have worse exercise capacity compared to men. That's been shown in multiple studies. And when women compared to men may also have different preferences for exercise. Women might prefer to work as a group, work out as a group, whereas men men may prefer to work out alone. And all those things need to be factored in when prescribing an exercise regimen. We also know that there are sex differences in the effects on body composition. Both the Heritage Study and the SHAPE Study demonstrated that. And we're still looking into this area to understand how um, exercise may benefit for uh, men and women differently. So in summary, exercise is a cornerstone of diabetes prevention and management. However, diabetes may impair exercise performance, which underscores the need for, for patients to actually work even harder to exercise. And there are special considerations uh, when prescribing diabetes, uh, exercise as a treatment to people with diabetes because of some of the medications they may be on and some of the diabetes-related complications they may have. There's multiple metabolic benefits that can be seen in people uh, with diabetes who exercise, particularly on cardiovascular disease. And as, as mentioned, the current guidelines from professional societies underscore regular exercise for persons with diabetes. And this will continue to be one of the central things that we prescribe. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you.